Good morning, good I think. Morning. Or is it afternoon? I think so. I don't even know right now. Okay. <laughs> but I actually am interested in finding out when you arrived to Tucson. Okay. Uh, I got to Tucson in the early 80s. I was unemployed. I'd been laid off from a uh, steel foundry in Phoenix, Capital Castings. And I moved to Tucson and uh, started looking for work. I heard they were hiring at uh, Hughes Aircraft, but you had to have soldering experience. And so I, I took some classes uh, through uh, Pima in soldering and applied, and I was hired. I uh, applied at Hughes because I was a political activist since my college years, and I wanted to work in the labor movement and I knew they had a union at Hughes, the Machinist Union, so I wanted to work with the Machinist Union. And that's when I got to uh, Tucson in the early 80s, 1982 or so, 81, 82, around there. And so what was your job primarily at, at Hughes? At Raytheon, I was an assembler for many years, then I took some more classes and uh, worked myself into a uh, technician job uh, working uh, at Hughes uh, on several missile product lines. And did you live on the south side of Tucson? Did you move there or did you move uh, somewhere else when you arrived to Tucson? Uh, I lived on the central Tucson when I arrived in Tucson and then later moved to um, the west side, much later on moved to the west side. And uh, so you didn't live at any point in actually south side Tucson? No, I never lived in the south side of Tucson. I would drive there to work every day. Uh, my um, companion, girlfriend at the time, my wife, and uh, eventually um, we moved in together. We lived uh, the U of A and then uh, moved to Eloy, Arizona in the late 80s, early 90s. Early 90s, I'd say, we moved to Eloy, Arizona. We were there a few years and then came back to Tucson. And before you moved uh, or you started working then for Raytheon, had you heard about the contamination plume or anything? Or, or when did you even first hear about it? I was aware that there were some contamination issues, but they really didn't take hold uh, in my consciousness. It, it didn't seem something really uh, big or important or captivating. But I worked with someone at Raytheon. Her name was Marie Sosa. She lived on Calle Evelina. And Marie would miss some work sometimes because she was ill. But she was just the sweetest person you could ever imagine. And when she came back, uh, I really enjoyed working her, with her. She was just great company. And she would mention the contamination at times. And I didn't continue to not pay much attention I heard peripherally that there was some contamination, that uh, Hughes Aircraft was primarily responsible. And uh, then she'd miss work again and come back and talk about the different surgeries that she was having. Um, one breast was removed, then she'd come back, another breast was removed. And finally I said, Marie, what the heck is going on? And then I, she kind of caught my attention because I liked her. I'd gotten to really value her friendship. And, and I was uh, concerned that she was having so, so many health problems, and not just her. She's, eventually, I, I learned that it wasn't just her. It was her husband who had uh, uh, some sort of uh, liver cancer, I believe. And uh, then she told me that everyone in her family had health problems. They thought it was the water. And she said even her dog died of cancer. And um, several people on her block, as a matter of fact, Guy Evelina, there was about 25 cases of cancer. So by then, I thought this, this is, you know, why, why isn't it on the front page? What, what's going on here? This sounds like a terrible, you know, catastrophe that should be investigated. It's, it sounds like uh, somebody should be ringing an alarm and, and bringing you all kinds of help. And, and she says, no, you know, there is, there is no help. And, uh, after that, 
I started paying close attention. And, but it wasn't until 1985 that a reporter from the Arizona Daily Star did an investigation and published a series of articles, a huge spread in the Arizona Daily Star. That was before the Star was owned by the conservative organization that owns it now. But they did an expose and they found out that uh, the wells that people had been drinking out of for, for many, many years, this started in the 40s when uh, consolidated aircraft started demothballing airplanes that could be reused during the Korean War. So they used solvents like TCE and, and other uh, solvents, and then they just uh, flowed from their cleaning operations into arroyos, into unlined ponds, and percolated into the desert. And as early as the early 50s, 1950s, some uh, residents, nearby residents just across the highway from Old Nogales Highway started complaining that their wells were fouled and their animals were sick and they couldn't drink out of them. So they complained uh, and the uh, city of Tucson to placate them, hooked them up to city water, but didn't alert anyone that the aquifer was being contaminated, that it was contaminating wells. They just kind of shut them up. I think they gave them a couple of hundred dollars and that was it. And the people took the money, they were hooked up to clean water, and that was it. That was in the 50s. But the contamination that started in the 40s continued to contaminate the aquifer in the 50s. 20 other residents of, of uh, the airport authority set up there, General Dynamics and, and uh, other companies that you used those solvents and continue to pollute the, the uh, desert and uh, continue to dump their hazardous waste in unlined pits and arroyos, and it continued to percolate into the aquifer for years, from the late 40s, through the 50s, through the 60s, through the 70s, and they say it stopped in the 70s, but I started working in uh, at Hughes in 1982, and I can say it did not stop because when I first started working there, I was degreasing some parts, and I said, what am I going to do with this? I had a container full, and they said, just open the door and dump it out. And I, I knew it wasn't the right thing to do, but I was a new employee, and not having any options, I did that, and then started thinking about this later. And I, I would see people dumping chemicals into the sewer, just down the sinks, in the laboratories. So I know that the contamination continued through the early 80s. And uh, in the meantime, I was aware that my, my friend Marie Sosa and her neighbor Sally Rendon was sick. Then I met another uh, lady, uh, uh, I can't think of her name right now, but uh, Melissa, uh, Melinda Gonzalez. Melinda Gonzalez was the head of the uh, teachers organization, it was an association, Sunnyside Teachers Association, and she had been trying to get some attention on this issue because she had noticed that a lot of people from her class were coming down with horrible diseases like lupus and cancer and scleroderma, and they were worried, they were very concerned, and they had gone to the Arizona Daily Star and they were working with Jane Kay and Jane Kay sounded the alarm. And luckily, the Arizona Daily Star published a whole slew of articles that, in my opinion, they're the first and last time that there was a connection between the uh, contamination, the exposure, and the health effects of that contamination. From that time, it's been just a slew of den denials, official denials. The official story is that no one ever drank enough contaminated water to make them sick. And if they did uh, drink contaminated water, it wasn't enough to, to be a problem, and it wasn't carcinogenic anyway. That was the position of the Pima County Health Department. Uh, Dr. 
Patricia Nolan, and they tried to say that, yes, there was quite a bit of disease on the south side, but that it was more connected to the lifestyle, more connected to the culture, more connected to the food, more connected to smoking, too much drinking, uh, practice of folk medicine, everything that was, um, but the millions of gallons of contamination that had been dumped in those neighborhoods or actually just uh, south of those neighborhoods by uh, the airport authority and by uh, Hughes Aircraft. And Burr Brown on the east side did it also, as well as a few other industries. And so since that time, people have been uh, suffering, you know, and uh, their cries for help and for aid, because this is a, these are horrible diseases that deplete people's lifetime savings, that bankrupt them, have gone pretty much unheard or officially denied or minimized. Uh, just an attitude of callous indifference by the authorities. And uh, it's an outrage. It's an injustice. It continues to this day. They knew from day one that Hughes Aircraft knew they shouldn't be dumping chemicals in the ground. They knew that they were going to percolate into the aquifer. They were told they had percolated into the aquifer as early as 1950. The city knew, and yet they continued this practice, totally indifferent to the Mexican population that was being impacted, to the Indian population that was right next door on the reservation, and really denied it up until the, the, the lawsuits that started coming up in the mid-80s. Gonzalez and Villarreal and Barron and Bud. Unfortunately, those lawsuits didn't go far enough. There was a settlement with a lot of the responsible parties, but what started out as class action suits were turned into individual suit lawsuits. So there was nothing to allow for future victims when some of these chemicals are, are mutagens they uh, damaged the DNA. PCBs also were dumped. And uh, chromium. Those are very potent ca cancer-causing chemicals. And uh, nothing was allowed for future generations that were going to come down with these illnesses. Nothing was allowed to take care of all these um, horrible illnesses. And they continue to this day. We still don't know. We're into the fourth and the fifth generation of little kids coming down with these horrible illnesses. We still don't know how far this is going to continue. And uh, because millions of gallons were dropped into the groundwater, because it wasn't just TCE, it was hundreds of chemicals. And the, there are many, many combinations of chemicals which no one knows what effect that can have on human beings. You know, the aquifer, which was a pristine lake uh, strat with stratifications, a complicated geological formations, very complicated with canyons and, and, and rivers and, and uh, valleys underneath the soil. But that contamination started migrating all over the Tucson Basin, and uh, that and the complicated formulas that Tucson water uses to distribute the water has contaminated tens of thousands of people in Tucson. And that's never been addressed for, as far as I can see. Uh, not the city, not the state, not the federal government, not, not uh, EPA. EPA will tell you right off the bat, we don't do health. All they're interested in is cleanup. Cleanup is good, but the people need, 
needs need to be addressed, and they never have been addressed. ATSDR, Agency for Toxic Substances and Disease Registry, has been in town. They've, they've done minimal, minimal uh, uh, investigations as far as I'm concerned. I'm not a scientist, but I've read the results. None of them you know, seem to be concerned or seem to, to, to be, uh, give it the, the, the attention that this issue needs. You know, there's just a lot of injustice in this world. This is another example of a catastrophe, a huge injustice. But, uh, you know, we all do what we can, so. And so you mentioned uh, the community, basically the person that you met, is it Myra Jones? Or, no, Marie Sosa, excuse me, that you met in Raytheon. Did you know prior to the Jane K. article in 85, do you know of any of if the community was organizing or if the community was getting together and discussing um, the, I guess, the what they were observing at their neighborhood level? Do you remember if there was anything happening? The there, not, not that I'm aware of, and when we started Desonans for a Clean Environment in August of, I believe it was August of 1985, it was me, Marie Sosa, Melinda Gonzalez, uh, Lucy Anderson, Lynn Prouty, and several others. I have membership lists from those days. I have minutes and so forth. Uh, I hate to name people because I, I always leave someone out. Saul Blackman came to the first meeting as well. Uh, let's see. Uh, there were other people who were working on environmental issues, but I didn't know them and wasn't aware of them. I came to know and meet other people, like Rose Augustine, who was working on some issues on the west side of the Tucson Mountains with another water company. And Myra Jones, Toxic Waste Investigative Group, I think they worked together with another group on the other side of the Tucson Mountains. They, they uh, eventually came and joined us and worked with us. And uh, Rose took over the group when I dropped out after a while. And Rose took it over and did a lot of real good work for the community. And can you tell me a little bit what was happening at the community level before um, you started Tucson Mountains for a Clean Environment? I'm not aware that anything organized was happening and uh, Tucsonans for a Clean Environment uh, pretty much exploded. And uh, we would call meetings, and they, they, they were well attended. We'd call uh, actions, and they were very well attended. I'm not aware that there were any other groups where we would have supported them, or they would have supported us. Any other groups on the south side that were addressing this issue? No. There were lots of individuals. They had found their own individual lawsuits. There were some workers at Hughes that had filed some lawsuits through, and because uh, they'd been contaminated inside the plant. Uh, we started a workers group also inside the plant at Hughes Aircraft. But I'm not aware of any other groups, local groups in town that were working on this issue. We'd call a news conference. We would be, uh, we'd have real good attendance from the media, good attention. Now, <laughs> no, they they pretty much blacked out this issue. So, and now it needs to be covered again because some of those chemicals that they didn't know about then, they could have known about it. They turned a blind eye to those chemicals because they were there. The PFAS and the PF, those perfluorocarbons, is, they're now in Marana. There's contaminated wells in Marana from the firefighting foam. And then the 1,4-dioxane, that's been there from day one. And um, lots of other chemicals, hundreds of them. Then, just as now, there were cries for help. There's cries out there in the community for help. And uh, a few of us were answered those calls. 
and I, and I was one of them. I worked with Marie Sosa. She needed help. We talked about let's form a group because as individuals we have, they're ignoring us. But if we form a group and pull in the strength of the community, organized strength, we can get their attention. And so she recognized the value of forming a group of people united, working towards a common goal. And uh, it did work. We did garner the attention. And lots of agencies started coming in and plugging in and seeing what they could do. And there, were, there was money thrown here and there. And, and the uh, TCE clinic, there was some change thrown in that direction. And when the money ran out, it ran out. They closed it. And there was, uh, we called for uh, uh, health studies. We called for an epidemiological study that was never done. We called for a cancer registry at the state level. The legislature passed a law that they had to have a cancer registry. I think they've, they've stopped working on that. The last time I looked, it hasn't been updated in, in several years. We called for a birth defects registry. That hasn't been updated for several years. Uh, as soon as the public attention drops, wanes, then the work stops. So this is an issue that has to be constantly be kept in the public, in the public eye. Uh, we cannot trust the, our uh, official representatives, any branch of the government, Arizona Department of Health Services, the EPA, uh, the federal government or, or the state government, Arizona Department of Health Services or the Pima County Health Department or Tucson Water. Um, we cannot trust them to take care of us. They're not here. We have to take care of ourselves because we're yanking on their shirt sleeves for attention at the same time the corporations are buying them off. The corporations now control our um, government at all branches and they don't want to be regulated and they don't want to be held accountable and to this day they've been successful. Uh, as they say, even Napoleon knew, back then Napoleon knew not to put the latrines upstream from his troops. They knew that. And Hughes put latrines, you know, right into our aquifer, which was our sole source of drinking water. And not one person who consciously did this has ever been spent a day in jail. Not one person has been fined. All the contamination that the uh, Superfund was paid for through taxpayer money. So you could say that the victims paid for their contamination and the victims are paying for the remediation of the contamination. So it's not right. It's not justice. It's wrong. Okay, Eduardo, I wanted to ask you a little bit about your role in Tucsonans for a Clean Environment. Uh, I founded the group with, along with Melinda Gonzalez, who was president of the Sunnyside Teachers Association. There were several other people at the initial meeting that we had. Some of them are uh, Lucy Anderson, Saul Blackman, Anne Montaño, my wife Lynn Prouty. Uh, and of course, Marie Sosa. And I may have left some people out and I apologize. So we founded the group and then we uh, published a newsletter. My wife and I published this newsletter, uh, probably not on a regular basis. May have gotten just a few issues out. We also published a brochure. And uh, we lobbied. We went to visit every, just about every single uh, Tucson City Council member. We lobbied the Board of Supervisors. We probably visited every single supervisor, um, representatives. We laid out our, the situation. We laid out our requests, our demands. We, we wanted uh, 
a registry set up that would identify all the people who were exposed to the contamination and follow them, monitor their health and follow them throughout the years so that early intervention would save some of them from horrible diseases. And uh, we lobbied also for a birth defects registry and, and a uh, tumor registry and of course cleanup of the groundwater and uh, we would have demonstrations and, and uh, protests and news conferences uh, things like that to, to try to put pressure on our politicians uh, there are a lot of good people out there who want to do the right thing but uh, as I said before, the corporations are too powerful and they, they, uh, they have a lot of influence, more than a lot, many of us do. And so now that you described a little bit about the activities that Tucsonans for a Clean Environment did, what was the overall goal of the group? Well, the overall uh, goal was just uh, justice. A company had come into town and committed a crime against the people that lived here. The aquifer is contaminated forever. They will never clean it up. The crime that are, is still continuing today with finding uh, the discovery of new chemicals that have been, people have been drinking all these years, like the dioxane and the PFAS up in Marana, the contaminated wells. So if you have a sense of justice, you, want, you need to be made whole again. People lost family members. There were deaths. People have been sick for decades, suffering. In a, a civilized society, there are avenues for private citizens who are injured by criminals to get justice, a measure of justice, to be made whole. And so, uh, out in the union movement, we file grievances. And when we win those grievances, the demand is always that the persons be made whole, that the people be made whole. If uh, damages are to be awarded, the damages are awarded. If cleanup needs to be done, that the cleanup is done. If people need to be held accountable, that there's an accounting, that people are held accountable. Many of those things, none of those things have been done. The criminals have gotten away with it. So that's not justice, that's wrong. And if that is, doesn't done, that isn't done, then it, it makes other corporations think that they can get away with it too. The corporations fight, fight against being regulated. Right now we're Everything's being deregulated because of the federal uh, government that we have. That, that's a big mistake. People need to be up in arms because if we don't regulate these corporations that are motivated only by how much money can I make, how much short-term profit can I make, not, a lot, not how much long-term damage will be done, it's how much short-term profit can I make, then there's going to be another TC catastrophe, another here or elsewhere. So there has to be an accountability. And I read uh, in somewhere online when I was doing the archival work, the Tucsonans for Clean Environment did of toxic tours. Uh, were, do you remember any of that? Were you involved in any of that? I don't remember... Uh, a campaign that we call Toxic Tours, and we took people around. But we did link up with uh, national organizations like the Citizens Clearinghouse for Hazardous Waste. That is Lois Gibbs of Love Canal fame, who came into town. And if she or other activists from other organizations, we would take them around and show them the problem and sh so they could get an understanding of the community. And uh, so we did that. Now, the toxic tours, if there was a campaign, it might have been after I was involved. I was initially the chairperson, although I don't think I held that title. 
but uh, we had a, we had a uh, financial person because we felt it was very important that the finances that we keep an eye on the finances and make sure that contributions went where they were supposed to go, and that if anyone ever asked us for an accountability of the finances, that we had financial reports and documents and all our ducks lined up. Uh, we wanted to avoid any kind of legal problems. And we had uh, minutes, which we took at every meeting to make sure that if people took responsibility for doing something, that we followed up and made sure that they, they were done. We had publicity campaigns. We had a membership camp, uh, committee, publicity committee, membership committee to go out there. We had outreach. We would do public forums to bring in uh, other people and solidarity. Uh, so those are some of the things that we did. And can you tell me a little bit about your work with Lois Gibbs organization? Well, Lois Gibbs uh, was, organization was very important because they would help us with the research. Lois Gibbs was a hub for contamination problems all over the United States. And so they were able to can uh, educate us about issues that, like ours, that had happened somewhere else, maybe the solutions that had worked somewhere else. They would suggest tactics for us and, and approaches that we weren't aware of. So they were very, very valuable. They still continue to help out on the South Side. Lois Gibbs was recently in town, and uh, th there was no coverage. <laughs> News releases went out, and uh, there was no coverage. She spoke at um, El Pueblo High School. Pueblo High School. Uh, it was a very well attended meeting. The community turned out, but no media. And how long were you involved then with Tucsonans for a Clean Environment? Okay, uh, I was involved with Tucsonans for a Clean Environment from the get go, and then for a few years, I think into the early late '80s. I don't remember the exact date. Uh, 89 maybe, 80, 90. I know uh, my daughter was born in 91 and then my wife and I were buried. Uh, we had to move to Eloy, Arizona and we were, we were buried and then another kid came along and then another kid came along and for many years we were buried in, in diapers and, and uh, kid issues, soccer, things like that. So I was only involved with T the TCE group for a few years, very intense years, and um, high burnout rate. And the uh, attorneys had come in about the time I left, and there was a general feeling that the attorneys were on board. They were now going to take care of the situation. And so it seems like activism dampened because people put their trust in the attorneys and that was a big mistake. I mean the attorneys did a good job for their clients but the scope of what they were able to address was very small. Hundreds of thousands of people have been impacted, affected and only a handful, 1800 people, benefited from the lawsuits and uh, settlements None of these cases went to court. They were settled out of court, in my opinion, because they would have lost in court and the penalties would have been a lot higher. But a lot of the discovery information that the attorneys collected has been kept pretty much sealed. It never made it into the papers. I'm not aware of it if, if it has. It may have. I'm not aware of it. So lives could have been saved by the discovery information that went into winning those settlements. But it's been kept buried, and so future generations have not been able to benefit from the tons and tons of research and discovery material. So... And what is your proudest moment when you were working with the Tucsonans for a Clean Environment? Like one of the things that you were most proud of during your, your 
Well, those were uh, very hectic times and uh, very intense and uh, uh, we were very fear oriented. I worked for Hughes Aircraft at the time. Hughes Aircraft was the pr primary perpetrator. Uh, some people in our group said that their houses had been broken into. Uh, I, uh, I don't know. So those were very intense times. We didn't really have time to think what are we are pr so proud of. We didn't take time to celebrate. It was one crisis to another. It's going from one crisis to another. So I don't know that we took time to take pride. Now, today, what can I look back and say that I took, that I take pride in? Gosh, I, I take pride in being a part of the many, many people who brought this issue to the public light. Because just because there hasn't been justice for all, and just because there hasn't been complete justice, there has been justice for some and it's not over. It's not over and maybe it's coming, maybe not in my lifetime, but maybe it's coming. And then, do you still keep up with the Superfund site? Um, are you still active in any way? I think you mentioned a little bit, but... Yeah, I, um, I was out of it for many, many years, my, but um, the kids are out of the house now and there's been new developments. The 1-4 dioxane development, has been in the uh, papers, and um, it's, be, it's been, been addressed, being addressed by the Environmental Justice Task Force with Linda Robles, and now the uh, contamination in Marana. So uh, I, I'm uh, reconnecting with the environmental justice movement and helping out where I can. So I, I, I am busy helping out where I can. Thinking back on your experience at the Superfund site, what would you recommend or like to see future generations learn from this experience? Well, organizations are more effective than individuals. Organizations are more powerful. And when working with politicians, it's important that organizations stay politically independent and don't trust that your goals are the politicians' goals. And how would you like the memory of your experience remembered? Memory of my experience? Mm -hmm. Me whose memory? Uh, like all the work that you've done for Tucson is for a clean environment. Like what you're saying that looking back, like what you've contributed to this bigger picture. Well, I've been told that no one knows that I founded Tucsonans for a Clean Environment. Well, I did. If that's remembered, that's good enough. And when I say I did, it wasn't just me alone. It was Melinda Gonzalez, as well as all the other people who came to the first meeting. We all contributed. There was a man named James Lemon from the Arizona Department of Health Services who first alerted many people to the issue. I think he alerted the EPA to. You hardly ever hear his name mentioned. You hardly ever hear Jane Kay's name mentioned. And Jane Kay is a heroine in Tucson. And her name should never be forgotten for the contributions that she made. I hope that one day you know, a uh, plaque or some sort of memorial is set up in the names of all the people who've kept this issue alive. You know, Linda Robles has kept this issue alive more recently, but Rose Agustin, Marie Sosa, Sally Rendon, lots of people have kept this issue alive. And how do you think that the memory of the Tucson International Airport Area Superfund site, 
how should that history be remembered at a state or national level? Well, that the regulatory agencies failed the city of Tucson and contaminated our aquifer forever. That the regulatory agencies who were supposed to protect us and come to our aid failed the people of Tucson and that the people are still suffering. And that uh, the regulatory agencies are staffed by really good, sincere scientists and uh, good people with good intentions. Uh, the, the University of Arizona failed the citizens of Tucson in that a publicly owned institution has not used its vast expertise to find the link between the people that are sick and the contamination. We know that there's a link. These chemicals were put into the groundwater. If you research the chemicals, It'll tell you, exposure to these chemicals causes cancer, lupus, scleroderma. These people drank the water. These people have those diseases, but yet they will deny that there's any link. If you ask for their help, and we have, they will tell you, I'm sorry, there's a conflict of interest. Why is there a conflict of interest between coming to the aid of the community and the mission of the U of A. Why is that a conflict of interest? Isn't this a taxpayer-funded institution? Shouldn't they be working for the community? As a community member, I know that you probably had to look at a lot of scientific information, how you're mentioning that you had to read a lot of the health studies that were coming out at the time, and you had to maybe look at a lot of the cleanup that uh, maybe EPA was doing at the time to try to figure out what was going on at that scientific level. Um, and you had to, as a lot of communities around the nation that do environmental justice work, they have to self-teach themselves sometimes uh, about this information. What was the most useful way of you learning about, say, the cleanup or the health studies when you're reading them? As I say, I worked at Hughes Aircraft. I was a member of the machinist union. I was a shop steward in the union for many years. I was president of the union. Uh, I ran into a lot of situations having to do with exposure on the job and chemical contamination. It was very helpful to have a union. It was written in our contract that we could refuse to do a job if we felt that that job uh, effect, impacted us negatively. Those were our rights, our union rights. So as a union steward, I learned how to analyze uh, safety situations, how to look for job hazards, how to read material safety data sheets. And I learned that things could be differently. People should have the same rights that are not in the union, in the community, to refuse to, to live in a community where they feel that their safety is a hazard to their health or their children's health. But the people in the community don't have that right. They can't leave. Their houses for, have lost value. People that know about the Superfund side on the south side, that know about the contamination, don't want to buy these houses. Instead, you have people, new immigrants, that are being victimized because they don't know any better. They don't know the history of the contamination. And it may still be occurring. It may still be occurring. I heard about a new uh, way that people are being contaminated. Is There's pockets of contamination in the aquifer where the contamination has col collected because of the, of the uh, complicated geology. And those are called hot spots. And those hot spots can, be, can go anywhere on the, on, on, on the south side. And maybe they can be under a school, for instance. And then vapors from those hot spots starts to migrate upwards, and it's called vapor intrusion. Look up vapor intrusion. And then they, here in the southwest, we close off the houses to prevent the heat from coming in, but we're also trapped in the vapors. And so that is another uh, phenomenon that I'm just now learning about, that that could, could be an issue. Continuing contamination on the south side, vapor intrusion. 
And during your time, did you attend any meetings on health studies in Southside Tucson? Well, uh, I attended uh, many meetings by official entities and uh, their dog and pony shows, in my opinion, their uh, PR campaigns, you know, to convince the community that everything's okay. But any question that's brought up about health studies is not addressed the way it needs to be addressed. It's dismissed. And uh, I've been to meetings where the uh, Pima County um, medical people have spoken to the public and uh, they're, they're, they're infuriating. They're, they're really infuriating. So yes, I've been to many, many meetings. Okay, what advice do you have uh, for the state and federal governments that oversee the cleanup? I think uh, they have, uh, the state and the federal government has, has really good people working for them, good scientists, good technicians, good laboratories, endless resources, but I don't have any advice for them because they get their marching orders from political appointees higher up the ladder. And the political appointees unfortunately get their marching orders from the corporations. So I don't have any advice for the state um, entities that they will listen to. You know, the, the, I'm getting off track, but we need a democratic form of government, and we don't have it. We have an, you know, corporate oligarchy. This is my opinion. And uh, until we have a government by and for and by the people, the people on the south side have articulated their wishes for decades and they've been ignored. All the state entities and agencies and federal agencies have heard them and they've been ignored. They will continue to be ignored until the people on the south side have power. But the people on the south side don't have that kind of power. It's more or less a poor community and it's a minority community mostly Mexican, Indians, and poor whites. They don't have the political power to impose their, to get their, their wishes, their desires, their needs, justice. So I'd be wasting my time to try to give advice to the state or to the city. You know, until the day that we can go to a city council meeting with 10,000 people, we will be ignored. And then what education or communication rec recommendations do you have for the new uh, generation that is active at the community level at the Superfund site? Do you have any recommendations for them? On communication? Yeah, or just like what they should do? Well, just real quickly that, uh, you know, uh, the young, young generation is real... Uh, digitally and involved uses of the internet and Twitter and and uh, those kinds of medium and uh, a lot of people on the south side don't have computers new immigrants a lot of them don't have computers some people don't even speak English so communication needs to be done a lot of times face to face and that's the most effective communication is uh, open honest and direct. And did your experience with the Superfund site change your thinking about pollution or chemical exposures in your home or your community? Yes, um, working at uh, Hughes, then Raytheon, raised my consciousness about the dangers, the hazards of toxic 
chemicals. And working with the uh, Superfund site has continued to provide me with an education on the dangers of um, the hazards of uh, waste. And it's brought me to the realization that the problem is much bigger than I ever thought it was. And so this is the end of the oral history interview. But is there anything else that you'd like to comment on that maybe I didn't cover in my questions and you just want uh, people to know about? Or anything else that you would like to add? Just that we all need to support each other. Just because it's not happening to you doesn't mean it's never going to happen. We have to empathize and put ourselves in other people's place. This is a picture of a uh, demonstration that we called. And uh, the demonstration happened uh, in August of 1988. We called the demonstration to protest an air stripper that had been installed at well SS-20. Air stripping was one of the designated methods that had been uh, picked to uh, clean the groundwater. There was a well and then there was a uh, stripper. The water was run through the stripper and it would take the TCE out, but then the TCE would be dispersed into the neighborhood. The TCE being dispersed through the air in the neighborhood was going to exceed Pima County air quality standards. And we were concerned about the cumulative effect of the exposure, because even though it was a small amount, cumulatively, the people there had already been exposed to other, to TCE for years. So we were protesting it. We wanted it shut down or moved someplace else that wasn't so close to the community. And those pictures are pictures of the community members that came out in support. We also invited politicians to come out in support. We invited uh, Dennis DeConcini, who was a senator. We in uh, invited Morris Udall, uh, Colby, the governor, Rose Mofford. We in invited uh, District 10 uh, representatives, Chuy Guerra, Carmen Cajero, Phil Hubbard. We invited Jaime Gutierrez, Peter Gudinoff, John Cromco, and... Uh, Ekstrom, more. These were supervisors, David Yetman and uh, County Attorney Neely. We invited the uh, Native Americans from the Tohono O'odham Reservation. Uh, the mayor, Tom Volge, the city council, Bruce Wheeler, Lynn Marcus, Roy Laos, Heckman. Uh, we invited Hank Eirich from the Pima Association of Governments and uh, Lois Kolakowski from the Pima Association of Governments and uh, had a news conference called for the shutdown of that uh, air stripper. Okay, and then what does all of this mean to you? Why did you select those pictures and what does that period of time or that memory mean to you? Well, we didn't really have a staff photographer but someone named Dee Dee Graham came to the rally, took the pictures, and donated them to the cause. And they're such beautiful pictures. We didn't have a staff photographer. We didn't have time to get it together. Those are the only pictures I have of the time. There may be others, but I don't know. So that's why I picked those pictures. They're <laughs> the only ones we have. Yeah, this was a logo that we had made. We, we, we had t-shirts made from this logo. And uh, the artwork was done by Elle McLean. Wanted to make sure she gets credit. It's just beautiful art, artwork.